One, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We only need one more Patreon subscriber to achieve our goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a jackhammer chatterbait or a pack of Senkos, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. You'll get access to our private Facebook group community, members only content, weekly Patreon supporter giveaways, and so much more. We only need one more, one more person to sign up and we'll have cracked our major milestone. Thank you guys so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate it. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Sorry, I have no idea why I hit crickets. Such a such a hyped up way to actually uh, start a stream, isn't it, guys? How is everyone doing tonight? We are back with a members only live stream this evening. Um, I was again, the plan is it, it, for, for the individuals that signed up and you don't under quite understand everything here. I want to do more live stream topics for everyone. It was really hard because it's there's no fishing tournaments on. It's really hard to fish during the dead of winter. No excuse, 100%. And then it's like, great. I have the first tournament of the year coming up, uh, up at Four Locks. And based on that event, I have something to talk about for my members. I have a great members live stream. Then I did that live stream and I didn't catch shit. Didn't catch a single thing. Didn't have a bite, nothing, which is fine. Like, I mean, that happens. But then my my brain, of course, being who I am, was like, oh, uh, what are we going to be talking about tonight? or this week. I don't really have, like, I don't know what to talk about. So with that said, I was like, you know what? I'm going to call up my good friend, Jeff, and I was going to see if he'd want to come on this stream. Uh, and then if you guys missed this, don't worry. This will be re-uploaded soon as a regular podcast episode, but this gives you guys early access to ask Jeff any of your questions uh, to just get them answered. But you guys aren't here for me. Without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Jeff Green. Hello. Hello, sir. It is. But last time I saw you, we were eating dinner uh, down at Richmond, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yep. That Richmond show is nice, man. I'm gonna have to. That, I'm gonna have to get a booth there next year. That was. That was a lot of fun, and I really hope we could try to figure out some kind of bigger booth thing there. Because perfect world, we had a. We just buy a big area, and then we can just all be there together, and we can talk fishing. And that's what I want to do: is try to make a big community that everyone can be a part of. So, but yeah, yeah. that was really cool. Yeah, you. Uh, hey, did you? Uh, you going to iCast? I'm going to iCast this year. Yep, I'm definitely going to iCast this my, year. Um, confirmation the other day. Let's go! That's yeah. freaking awesome, dude. Dude, yeah. it's it's a lot of fun. You're gonna enjoy it. The first time you're a little starstruck because you see all these people you saw on TV. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff there, but it's a fun experience. It's just an absolute blast. Yeah, I'm gonna go and um, check it out this year. You know, everyone I missed their own opinions about everything, but um, I got to go see it for myself. I'll probably like it. You, 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 you'll love it. You'll really love it. And then we got some people in the chat here already. We got, let me pull this one up here. We got, we got uh, Kyle. I, uh, yes, sir. Let's go. Absolutely. And then we also have, uh, whoop, we got Carly bird. We got, Hey Jeff. And then we uh, got Greg horny. Uh, and he's saying like, Hey, Thomas and Jeff, absolutely guys, you know, come on. I also dropped the link on Patreon guys. You can watch on YouTube. You can also watch on Facebook stream. We're finally getting into March. Thank God. It feels like for us fish heads, winter is slowly melting away. It's not, it's not yet gone completely, but I feel like we're getting kind of close to it. The water temperatures don't suck. Um, Jeff, I is the worst month of the year, man. It sucks. It's just, it's depressing as hell. Like the fishing can be okay, hit or miss, but it's just blah. I mean, you it, know? It, it could be good. I mean, or right now, it, 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 you know, with the wa water warming up, it could be good. Um, it was good in the middle of February for a couple of days. Um, like real good when I had some trips. Mm -hmm. uh, one guy caught a 21 inch, caught the 20s, 18s, some 19s, some big smallmouth, man, on, on both rivers. Dude, that's insane. Well, uh are, are you splitting time pretty much between both rivers equally right now, the Susquehanna and the yeah. Potomac? Yeah. Yeah. My, th this, this, um, the rest of this week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah, I'll 
go back and forth. I just, I'm so excited for this warmer weather. I mean, like I, I told this story, I haven't told this to you yet or off camera. So this is a good live reaction. I, uh, so I took the boat out a couple of days before the tournament, trying to make sure everything works. Cause you know, I have an older boat and I just want to make sure the engine was running good, put it away, get up early Sunday morning, go take it out. And I, I go because I'm trying to be smart. I'm gonna put the plug in early. Well, the hole was freaking frozen. There was a water sickle going down out of it with ice. And I'm like, shit, I have no way to put the plug in the boat. And then I take the cover off and then I find out the whole bottom because my cover is like 200 years old and it's basically dry rotted. The whole bottom of the boat is caked in ice. So Mm. like an intelligent person, I drive to a gas station and I buy some of that, that windshield wiper fluid that's like for negative 30 degrees. And I just undo the cap and I just pour it in the bottom of my boat, destroying the carpet. But it was able to work its way through and de-ice the plug so I could actually put the thing in. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah what you should put in there is uh, uh, you can also, if you're worried about that, you can put the plugs in it and you can use that RV um, coolant. The red stuff. You ever seen it? No, what is it? Antifreeze. Oh, RV, really? Yeah, RV and boat antifreeze. Yeah. Hmm. Camper. Yeah. That's really yeah. freaking cool. Like, uh, yeah. You put it in there um, after you've after you fished. Just dump it down the uh, like in the live well area. Uh, let it go down that drain. I mean, you're gonna have to let that water. Uh, you're gonna have to clean that, clean that out before you put fish in it. But if you're gonna store it, dry, um, pour that stuff down the drains and through the boat and let it drain out and then um you can you can store the boat it's not going to freeze anymore that's actually a brilliant idea and then we have a question here uh we have it from brian wilt brian uh what kind of boat and motor do you have brian what i have is i have a 2000 literally a 2000 ranger comanche it's a 21 foot i think it's a 520 and i have a 220 mercury two stroke um She's got some hours on it, and she was definitely having issues getting on plane, but I still love her because she's paid off. Uh, but one one day we'll get a new boat. One, one day we'll, we'll get a newer boat. Um, Jeff, what, what 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 boat are you running? I have a Sea Arc jet boat, um, and I have a uh, 6040. Uh, it's a 2023 6040 Mercury on the back of it, and I have a, a 2023 uh, uh, Minn Kota 80-pound thrust thrown motor on the front. <sighs> You need every bit of that to bite and be able to do it yeah. on the river. Yeah, the, the the sizes I like are those 60 horsepower and those uh, 90s. I like both those size motors. They're, they're, there's, there's plenty enough power in them. I think that's a great little segue before we get into the fishing part of it. And then, guys, if you have your questions for Jeff, 100%, start, start reeling them out, and I'll make sure they get answered. Um, Brian, actually, Brian will... Uh, Brian posted a really idea a really great question to me uh, on facebook and then guys yeah if you have topic ideas or whatever please reach out to me and I, I can get them answered which is about jet boat running because honestly a jet boat is completely different than trying to run a regular prop engine um what what tips and what's different about it and how do you run your jet boat how do i run it um do you have any I mean, tips for beginners a lot of different variables involved in it i mean because it's sucking water up uh you know, it depends on the water level. Um, you, you, you definitely, if you can help it, you definitely want a, a boat that's an actual jet boat, not just an aluminum boat. You want a, you want a jet boat with a tunnel on the back of it. That helps out a lot. That helps you get up on plane. That helps you uh, keep the uh, motor up um, up above so you're not striking rocks with the, uh, with the foot of the jet. Um, I mean, I use mine all the time, so, so I never have to... Uh, uh, do a um a winter service on it you know where you winterize it mm. um a lot of people don't really think about this but if you know if you, if you live somewhere where you can go outside in your driveway and plug it in like on a um during in february you know a couple times a month and plug it in to your hose and run the motor you don't have to uh, winterize a boat i think people think you have to winterize a boat and you don't as long as you run it that's a really good point. Like running it constantly is really important. Uh, how many times do you think you need to run it per month to keep it? I don't know. A couple times. I, I would think two or three times a month. If you can get out and do it, 
but it's not going to hurt the boat to sit for a, a month um, and then get back to it. You know what I mean? But um, like January, if you're not going to go fishing after October, take it out two or three times a month in the driveway, hook it up to the hose and run it, run it for about five, 10 minutes and then put it away. And then that, and during that time, you can check the batteries and, and you know, and, and make sure that um, everything's hooked up correctly. Make sure you don't have any loose connections and just um, tuck it away for the, uh, you know, till the next month. We got Kyle. I here. Kyle. I with his first question is, do they make different style covers for the bottom? I've seen a few that look like they would really suck up rocks or suck rocks right up. Does um, he mean the, um, he's talking about the foot of a jet jet motor. I'm a hundred percent sure that's what he's talking about. That's why that's my only concern about buying a jet engine. Oh so yeah. Yeah. The foot of the boat. No, I mean, you, you got to understand when you're running it. So when I get close to the shoreline, if I'm running it up near the uh, uh, boat ramp or, I'm close to the shore. I shut the motor off and just dripped in. You don't want to start that motor in, in real, real, real shallow water because it sucks the water. It sucks those rocks up. And once it sucks the rocks up, it it hits the uh, those rocks will bang around inside that uh, where the impeller is, and um, it it scars up the uh, the liner that's in there. There's a liner that goes around in that, um, and it's it's really uh, fine, you know, real fine. Um, uh, tolerance that's in there. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you want to, you want to watch that. And then you want to watch when the river's rising. There's certain times where I've learned over the years, you don't want to go out when the river's rising. If there's a bunch of crap coming down the river, cause you're going to suck up, uh, you could suck up a tree, you know, uh, sticks and, and crap like that. And then, um, they'll get wedged up in the, uh, in the impeller, mm. you know, take the uh, foot off and drop the impeller. That sounds I miserable. Got, I, had, I sucked one up one time and it shut the motor off. Yeah. What happened? It just, the stick got stuck up there and it, um, and it got jammed. There's supposed to be some type of, uh, like a, um, shear shearing type deal deal in there where it'll, uh, like a shearing pin almost like your trolling motor has. But yeah, I've never I've never had it where it's it's broken anything like that where it just free spins so it doesn't tear the motor up. Huh. But uh, yeah, you know, there's just a bunch of different circumstances. But your your uh your jet's not going to suck up a bunch of stuff as long as you uh bring it out into you know two three feet of water and then start it up. It, <clears throat> how big of an enemy is grass to it? Oh, it's it's worst nightmare. Grass and leaves. The fall in the in the summer. Yeah, I was thinking like like with this time of year, it's probably the perfect time that you can actually run a jet boat without having to deal with all that crap. Yeah, now and then into spring, and then once you get into like late June, July, when the grass starts growing in, yeah, it's it's a problem. But you know, there's give and takes on that. Um, you know, usually there's places where you can uh, you can run up through there and not and not suck up the grass. And if the grass is low enough, and, and if it's not coming to the surface of the water. You can plane over top of it. That I think is important to know. Like about what depth do you think it has to be at? Or is it just like a, a gut? A few inches underwater as long as you're up on plane. And we got a great question here by Brian. Uh, we got Brian here in the chat. Brian says, For the uh for the first for first time jet owners like myself, what's the best way about not messing the boat up? I thought taking it slow would help, but I think I hit every rock on the river. Is it just a time on the water thing or get a guide? It's a time on the water thing. And yeah, you're not going to tear the boat up if you're just putting around, but um, yeah, there's certain rocks that you, that you'll bump on the river that you wouldn't bump if you're up on plane. So that's a tough question to answer. Uh, it depends on the circumstances, the situation you're in. And, um, you know, some stretches of the river are just too advanced uh, for certain, you know, some people are more advanced than others. That's a, gr can I add to that? Like, what would you consider to be a nice beginner's area? You just bought a jet boat and you want to get out and just putt with it. What area um, of the upper Potomac? Seneca. Seneca. Go out of, uh, go out of Riley's Lock and run north. Okay. And, um, yeah, run north and and uh, you want to you know you want to take the river it's small sections at a time and you want to learn those areas before you really start taking off. 
I mean, I've learned all this by experience. No one taught me any of this stuff. That makes so much freaking sense is to have an area that you know you're safe. You can drive the boat around, get get a handle for it. And, and then the other thing I would I would ask you is like to, to piggyback on this question. I would assume flow rate is very important when you're making your decisions too, right? Yeah. Or your, your, your flow level. Yeah, but I mean, you can get out on the river when it's when it's pretty high and, and do okay. What would you consider for a weekend warrior who doesn't get out very much? What's a good average flow rate to where I can look at the gauge and know like my boat's safe? You mean like uh, on the on, on the Potomac? Yeah. Um, like if the point of rocks, no, no one look for whatever reason, no one looks at Edwards Ferry's gauge, and that's what I use. But for point of rocks, something like um, uh, three, three to five, uh, three, three, three to four feet. And you can get around fine. And what is dangerous level? Like it's going to be hard to move around. Oh, anything. Um, once you start getting close to two feet at, at, uh, at a uh, point of rocks. I mean, there's rocks, man, that don't, you can't even read in the water. You just have to know they're there in the river. You can't even read them. You can't even, they're not even showing themselves and they're inches under the surface for whatever reason. They don't, they, they don't show a, a disturbance at the surface of the water or the, you will know, hit them. The Susquehanna is famous for it. Really? Yeah, there's places where um, where you're just putting along, and all of a sudden there's a rock, and you'll run up on it. How is the mapping on the Upper Potomac and the Susquehanna? Are they both bad? There really isn't a map, uh, like a map for like the uh, those uh, unnavigable waters, those uncharted waters. The Potomac has a has a map. But I mean, it's not going to, it's not going to let you, you're not going to really navigate. It just, it just shows you um, the river, shows you the islands. It shows you some of the old like Indian fish traps and stuff like that. That's at Jim, Jinko. Jinko. That? Yep. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, that's at uh, G, G M C O Jimco maps. Hmm. Uh, Jake's bait and tackle sells them. And you can also get them online too. I think yeah, Amazon and, or eBay. Still in business. I I ordered some um, some more maps from them recently. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. And then we we got Brian has another question here. Let me make sure I get the right one up here first. Sorry, uh, we got Brian again. Uh, how about water levels on Shenandoah, Big Eddy area? I don't fish the Shenandoah. Big Eddy area is near Watermelon Park, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that one there, I would say it's got to be two feet plus to be able to run around there. Um, because you have it's it's a little bit more slack water, you should be okay. But yeah, so still still in that two plus feet range. Uh, then you have Millville Dam area. Uh, the Millville Dam, you can go just below that Big Eddy to the Millville Dam, and yeah, you can fish there year round because it's literally right at the dam. Uh, let's see what this next question here is. We got Shane Kelly. Uh, they ones you can't see get you every time. Yeah. The the one, the rocks you can't see are the ones that are going to really screw. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to mess you up big time. Yeah. But see here, there, there, there's a, there's another problem with, with when you're running a jet boat, if you're up on plane and you're coming up on a rock and, and you see something and it's just underwater and you have a cup, you have an in, inches of water, but you think you're going to strike it. You can't let off the, uh, the, the throttle because if you do, you're going to hit it real hard. Yeah. Um, and hopefully you're going down river because usually the rocks are facing down river. You'll slide and, over top of them. And then this is where, in my opinion, when it's I had all experience, I, it's all experience. And the one way you can make up for experience a little bit is to have good GPS navigation on your boat. And the reason is, it's not because of the mapping, but it's the trails you can leave. You can mm -hmm. you can color code trails. So uh, for 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 Brian, if you get yourself any of the of the really good quality uh, GPS units now with an external antenna, you can color code your trails, and so you can go up, and then the trail's terrible. You hit three rocks, you almost kill your wife, and then you can take and you can X that trail out. Then you can also go up there, and you're like, it was clean, no problems. You can highlight that one in green or red. And save it. And then you know the rest of the time, if your trail is the color red or green, that's safe to go through. So that, that's the one thing I think about GPS is, is so cool now. Without hey, who mapping. Was the, who was the person that asked if you should get a guide? Uh, that you would remember? be Brian. I thought people go out with me for that, but 
when you go out, I think some of the people that have gone out with me before, they don't ask me the right questions. And then it becomes a, a, all they want to do is fish, but they, they hired me to take them out to show them the river. Mm. And we could fish and that's fine, but um, there's a lot to know. And, and um, if you ask someone like me or someone that's been on the river for a long time and that's out there every day, uh, it can cut your learning curve down tremendously. They can. And some people in the industry like look down on that, but it's a safety no, thing. No, no, no. I, it's I a like safety that thing. people call me about that kind of stuff. And um, I'm, I'm more than happy to show them if they book a trip um, on understanding how to, how to read the river. I had people call me up before in college and even now that haven't fished the tidal Potomac before. And they're like, can you go into that Quantico Creek, the Marine base? And it's like, no, <laughs> you cannot fish there. It would not be good for you. Or like, can I fish for that old, like a uh, submarine dock? It's like, it, it would be a quick five minutes of your life before you get shot. So it, I do like when people ask those questions personally, cause it's like, it's a safety thing. Like where can I run? So I don't get in trouble. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, you know, there's, there's creeks on the Potomac river where, if you go up into the creek, if you get high water, there there's places where there's like wooden um, bridges that go across and and they're real low and the creeks are usually real low. But sometimes you can get back in those creeks and there's fish and you can get up like I've, I've gotten out of my boat and pushed the boat over the over the bridge to the other side or run up over top of it. If, if there's yep. a log and it's in the way in the creek, I run up with my jet boat because I have a jet. I've just gone over top of the log if it has if there's enough water on it. But the problem is, once you go up in those creeks, here's, here's a problem um, when you're asking about running the rivers. If you go up in those creeks, you have to remember that the water's falling when you're going in there. You can, get, you can literally get stuck back there if you take too long. That's a very good point. I didn't even think about that. Um, yeah. you, you guys are asking great questions. It's here. Let me like get a up. tide, but it, you know, there's no tide, but it's almost like a tide. And you, you, know, you better spend maybe uh, 30 minutes to an hour back there, but you better get out of there. Mm -hmm. stuck i didn't even think about that and yeah. but that's just time on the water you know like you can't like you can't know that stuff unless you've gone through it and that's where it's like having like networking getting some friends talking to them about boater safety i mean i know a lot of the old river rats are like really kind of tight-lipped and don't want to talk to you about stuff but if you're talking about boat safety a lot guides of them are, are pretty good guides will teach you about the river yeah gu Operating guides a, will a boat on the, on the river yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Especially the, uh, you. The Maryland Department of Natural Resources police are the the game wardens. I don't think that's why they run the river very much. Because no, no one, no one is is assigned to the water to the river all the time, and they take those boats out, and then they end up damaging them. Do they not they, have a jet boat? No, they do. They have. They do. They have. Um, they have real nice ones. They have uh, rock groups, I believe. And they, they never use them. Jets. But for some reason, they end up tearing them up. And I, I think that's because they're, there's just not a couple guys that are dedicated to just assigned to just the river and running the river constantly. So they'll go out and they'll hit stuff. Mm. I've seen I, I've seen where they hit a rock real, real hard one time and it just disabled their boat completely. Holy shit. Yeah. That's freaking insane. Yep. Let's see. Okay, we got a bunch of questions we're going to get so, through I mean, here. It, it takes a long time. I don't know. Those guys, they have to train those guys or at least give them a class. And just giving someone a class on that, you know, they're not out there physically showing them. So, yeah, I mean, it, it takes time and, um, you know, getting information from people that, that run the river like me or someone else. And uh, it, it really, it really um, you know, the, the curve of learning, you know, it's a lot less. Preach it. Preach, preach, preach. Uh, Greg has another great question here. Greg is, is the Edwards ramp accessible or is it still closed? It's if still it is closed. closed, it's still closed. Yeah. When do you think it'll be open? I did a video not too long ago. Um, and I was at Edwards Ferry. Go check it out on his YouTube channel, guys. Yeah. On my YouTube channel. I, I was at Edwards Ferry. I have no idea, man. It looks like they haven't done anything and they closed it. Why did they close it? I guess they're going to fix the bridge. That's weird. But the bridge looks like it's been fixed, but I guess maybe it was a temporary bridge. And then they've closed um, Dargan too. That bridge at Dargan was like wooden. You could run a tank across it and nothing would happen. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I get kind of um, 
preserving historical stuff like the canal. But at some point, it's like that thing is annoying as hell. So at four locks, you have to drive underneath the 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 railroad trestles and the and the canal thing portion of it just to get to the boat ramp. And it's mm-hmm. about that much clearance on either side of your vehicle. Yeah, and no, it's so yeah, stupid. I know the tunnel you're talking about, yeah. It's so annoying because it's just like, okay, you have this nice boat ramp, you have all this stuff, but you have to drive through this like ghetto hole in the ground. Can we save yeah. a portion of the trail and get rid of the other piece or can we drive over to I don't know. Anyway, that's a that's a hard little thing there. Kyle, I'm gonna get your questions here. I'm gonna Kyle Kenny's next. Kenny has Kenny says, seeing a lot of success stories on the hover rig on the DOA. Either of you have tips on this rig for upcoming months? No. I'll let Jeff go first. I have none. I need to do some work on this. Uh, I think you're talking about like the Bassing Brothers too, Kenny, if I'm not mistaken. I think the Bassing Brothers had some stuff on that. The hover rig, all it does is it basically takes... And I have all my stuff in the boat or I'd bring this out. But all the hover rig does is it moves the weight back further in the bait so when you cast it out it's up here and it drags down like that and then case is like yeah that's right uh yeah okay oh, is like yeah that's right yeah um so basically all that's so that's what the hover rig does the hover rig in of itself is it it displaces the weight back a little bit more and then so that bait's going to slide down a little bit more or here's the kicker if you do it on slack line it's going to spiral all the way down so there's two ways you can fish it. And the hardest thing is this bait works the best with forward facing sonar because you can see how fish react. If fish are tight, are tight to the bottom or low in the water column and they shoot straight up when they see the splash, those fish are really susceptible to you cast it out and just let it drop and it, and it does its weird like death si- spiral. If though they're not doing that and they're kind of just kind of like lethargic, holding tight line, letting it pendulum down is the best thing. And then in general, you want to go with the lightest head possible because the lighter the head, the better action. But I will do a full breakdown on that uh, when I have stuff here to break it down with. Um, let's see. There's Okay, here, Kyle's got some questions here too. Um, let's see. Okay, oh, he's talking about Algonquin. Sorry, I'll get up to the beginning one here. Kyle I. Algonquin is usually pretty easy to navigate. And that place has come alive with bait fish swarms under my kayak every time I go out. Monster smallmouth too. Uh, go. I'm gonna get to the next one here. Going to be crazy good once the weather warms up. Does Jeff ever fish the Algonquian section of the river? I do. There I you fish, go, Kyle. I pick people up from the boat ramp there too. Sometimes. How deep is it there? Is it gener- generally like a little bit deeper compared to the other parts no, of the I mean, river? It's it's like four feet, four or five okay. feet. I'm, I'm there's there's some deeper spots, but uh, it's uh. It's deep enough to be, uh, you know, to go out there and, uh, and you know, for recreational purposes too, because uh, Algonquian south of that is uh, uh, Seneca, Riley's. Gotcha. Hawk. And um, they had that that area is a really good area to uh, to go out on and, and learn the river and, and navigate. What about Dargan? Dargan, uh, just the just the initial area is where you put the boat in yeah, uh, going down towards dam three and then it'll start getting shallow, but there's a, a, a couple miles of river stretch of river there. That that's uh pretty good. Did pretty you easy to navigate? Do you know about that? Uh, that tournament that went out of Brunswick this year? Uh, yeah. It, if you know about the weights and stuff, what did you think? Did you uh, think no, that I, was, I don't know about the weights. I just know there was a tournament there. <laughs> There were, uh, it was really tough this year. Um, it took, I think it took place, uh, and Ken, Kenny's in the chat here, so he can probably help me out. I think it took place about two weeks ago uh, in mid February. That time, do you think it was the best time to actually hold a tournament? Like, when do you think the best time in the winter is to hold a tournament? I guess is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> Whenever you can run one, it's just going to depend on the weather. I mean, you're going to want, uh, if, if you want, if you're asking like optimal, um, conditions yeah you're gonna want the water temperature around 42 degrees you're gonna want the water to have be stained and have some like you know two or three feet of visibility and you want the water level to be um above average gotcha 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 you want it to to be um on the higher end that's what i was trying to ask uh let's see and then greg we got i'm pull this up here oops sorry wrong one we got greg in the chat greg says 
How clear is the water currently? It's clearing up right now. It's uh, um, it's fishable. It's stained. I don't know how many feet of visibility. I, I couldn't really tell you that. What do you think the water temperature is right now? It's in the uh, 40s, low 40s. 40s. Mm -hmm. It was Which falling. Compared to in January when I went out, it was like 36. <laughs> it was yeah, cold, I went out, land. I was on the Susquehanna recently, and the damn water temperature up there was like 36 degrees when we went out. And it was a tough day fishing. And then later on in the day, we started catching fish. How is the Susky fishing right now? Good. It was fishing real good in, in February. <laughs> and we went out one day and hammered them. All, all on jerk baits, man. That's freaking awesome. Suspending That's jerk awesome. baits. Jerk bait season's coming. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's here. I'm thinking more for largemouth and stuff. But like, yeah, like, I mean, jerk bait season's here. Uh, it, I don't know. I'm excited because like January is the sad thing where it's like, it's almost kind of winter time or like winter time's in. It's almost kind of springtime, but now it's like, we're here. You can feel spring is, is getting here. And, and as March rolls on, winter. we've had a tough winter, like compared to like, yeah, like this is the most snow we've gotten in about two years, I think. And yeah, this, um, usually it's, it's a little bit more mild, even in February. Yeah, we could still get snow in March, though. When was the last time we had snow in March? I don't know. Two don't, years, three years. I don't think it's been that long ago. Yeah, it was because like the first time we met at the. Um, yeah, West, was, was, was that in March? Berkeley Springs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that, so, was, that snow was bad. That was that was a terrible uh, drive home. If I so remember correctly. Two years ago. So it was two years ago. We had that big snowstorm in March. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of hoping that this is kind of like we're going to have an early spring when that well, stupid hey, the, gopher. The, the groundhog says we're going to have an early spring. You saw that. Punxsutawney Phil said we're going to have an early spring. I love that you know his first name. Uh, yeah, I, I'm hoping it's a... Uh, it's a. He's right. That stupid little rat. He's probably carrying Lyme disease and everything, too. We got uh, we got Craig Anthony. Craig Anthony, dude. Yeah, I'll get you your gift card on Sunday, too, boss man. I saw your text message. Sorry, I didn't respond. But yeah, 42 degrees, water temperature. Uh, we have another one here by Cliff Bennett, my boy. Cliff also is one of the guys who won our uh -oh. photo contest, too. Uh, it was 47 yesterday, and I whacked him. Yeah, the water him. got up pretty warm. Yeah, it did. It really did. Like, it's so, like if we hit 55 degrees, 60 degrees in March, does that mean they're going to start spawning, you think, early? No. no. Just because the temperature gets to a certain point doesn't mean anything. It would have to get there and then stay there. And then, um, like, once it gets to a certain point, it's never going back. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's why that's why you see that when they when they start spawning in May, I mean that they know better than we do, but um, they know that water's not going below like let's just say sixty degrees ever again until until next November or you know or December. You know what I mean? I think that's where it's like daylight to me is the bigger factor here, and I think what this is I'm, I'm going to do a video on this at some well, point. Well, yeah, if, if, the, if if there's not as if, if there's not as much light either. Uh, that means it's gonna, the water's going to be able to get colder throughout the day. But, 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 but here's the other thing. Here's the juice. You're going to love this. When there's less light in the fall, vegetation starts dying off. Yeah. And I think the vegetation dying off really kicks them into like, oh shit, fall's coming. Yeah. I, I think this is, this is a big thing here. I think in the springtime, people have a hard time knowing how the daylight affects it because we have daylight savings time at a wonky time. We have daylight savings time in the fall in like November, but we have daylight savings time in like in March. Mm -hmm. So it's harder to tell when you see that, that big jump in, in daylight because it tricks you that in, in a week and some change guys, March 9th or whatever, we're going to get an extra hour. Yeah. We but, haven't but for us. Not yes. For the, not for the animals. Exactly. Exactly. And that's Nothing the false for them. Bingo. And that's a false alarm. So in our heads, it's like, well, spring's here. Not necessarily for the fish, depending on what it is. I still think it's between like mid-March to late March. There's some time in there when it flips, there's enough daylight. I think they need that extra hour. There's an extra hour of daylight that you get naturally without the clock changing. That mm -hmm. natural hour, I think, happens in late March. And I think that's why you always see this big push late March, is that's when you get that extra hour of daylight. So that's my conspiracy theory on daylight savings time. <laughs> uh, 
So sorry for uh, bothering people with that. But let's get into some baits now, too, also. like Because you absolutely had some big fish caught lately. Yeah. We're catching them on. Hey, look, I'll, I'll show you the size in the brand. I mean, the um, yeah, the two brands I was using. Um, the Lucky Craft. I've been catching them on 100s, man. We've been catching hammers on 100s. So, yeah. I don't know if you can see that. This color right here. Chartreuse Shad. That's a bad color right there, man. I love that That's color. 100, and this is a 78. Wow. I have all these in stock, too. This is a, a 78. And then the, um, the uh, X-Wraps. This is a good color. But the X-Wraps have been catching them, too. But in the clown color, I don't have that one in stock right now. What color is that, though? That one's cool it's color. It's called Blue Steel or Hot Steel. I wish it was Blue Steel. That'd be funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's my call at that. Yeah, no, it's uh, Hot Steel. Pretty good color. Yeah. I've, and, I've, these X, and these XR8s have the, um, I like the tail on them, too. You know, they have that little feathered tail. Hmm. So XR8s, XR10s will catch them, too. That's pretty dope. And then we also have this this uh here's a fun here's a fun question from Kyle I. Kyle I says, "When can I start throwing this uh Zara spook?" You can so throw whatever you want to, but to catch fish, probably uh I would say probably um once the water gets up above 60 degrees, you can start trying it. So well, talk, I would say April. To, uh, to to really be effective, probably June. Mm, June boy. Okay after they've spawned and maybe in the heart of the spawn and in, in may yeah I might get them but um i mean i'm just throwing plastics and you know in certain lures then I don't know, i'm not that crazy yeah, but... about topwater baits you know what i find about topwater baits i like them and they're fun but um i find that people lose fish a lot with them they're pretty tricky yeah but it's just it's enjoyable though uh and this is like I mean, and, and the ones they lose they're losing, their, you know, they're monsters that hit it, man. Kyle says, can't beat that top water spawn with a bike. Come on, boys. It's like, I, dude, I don't disagree with you. It's it's a beautiful thing when it happens. Um, oh, I fish for them with it. We, we do it. But, um, I mean, I'm only fishing top water if, if I know we're going to catch fish with top water. I'm not trying it out or anything. There is something, gonna something that we're going to be actually catching fish with. There is something religious. I mean, it's almost a religious experience when you go out in the summertime on a long day in June and it's like just about dusk and you start throwing a popper around and you can't see your, I, I did this in oh, July. Oh dude. In July. I still remember this. I caught a, uh, almost a four pounder and it was so dark out. We couldn't see more than three feet. And you cast out there and it's bloop, 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 bloop. And then bloop. Kadoosh! And you don't see it, but you just know like, Oh boy. And it's, ah, uh, it's still fun. It's still a lot of fun. Um, so I, I guess on team top water, but I wouldn't do it in a tournament. Like if I was in a tournament, I probably wouldn't do that because it's like, you're right. Like you're going to lose half the fish you stick. Um, yeah, you lose a lot of fish with them. And um, it's just, I think some of those fish have better vision than others when it comes to hitting stuff on the surface. Like yes. people do. Yes. And um, I think some are just better at it than others. And the ones that are really good at it, those are the ones you don't lose. And then some of them will nail your, your uh, top water bait and never even hook themselves. Mm hmm. I mean, how do you swat at something with two or three treble hooks on it and not hook yourself? Because they're they're really intelligent creatures that we don't give enough credit. Like, yeah. they're just, it's insane. And I think a lot of times with the small mouth comparatively to large mouth, I think they'll hit stuff with their mouth closed to kill it or stun it. Um, yeah, probably. You see this on, I keep, when, when they go to uh, Lake Champlain, they talk about that a lot, like how the small mouth have terrible aim there. They don't oh, really right. hit it. Yeah, they don't hit it on the first try. And you'll watch them like on live and they're like walking the dog and these things are just smacking the hell out of it but never taking it. And in my opinion, that's because they're trying to stun it so it like it flutters down mm -hmm. and then they can eat it. That's my thought process. I don't know if that's true or not, but that that's what no, I there's think. A, there's a place, that, there's a time and place for them though. Like, you definitely want to try them. You definitely want to throw them. I do believe in this though. If you're throwing topwater bait and you have a friend, he should have a fluke on. And if you're alone, have like a fluke or something like a weightless bait available. So if you're throwing your topwater bait and you get a massive blow up, 
you can reel that thing in and you can cast yeah. out your fluke or something to follow up because Cinco. they'll still hit. Yep, you follow Cinco. Up with a Cinco. Yep. Oh, you can catch so many good fish that way. And largemouth too. And then you, you, you know you can use a topwater bait in the summertime. Once you start fishing early in the morning and you're throwing like a plastic and they're hitting it immediately when it hits the water. Yes. Yes. You know, like a Stinko or some type of other plastic uh, bait. Even a tube, if you're throwing a tube and they're hitting it and you know it's not going to the bottom. We got your, Joe. Your line's going tight. We got Joe in the chat here. Joe says, uh, "My oh, whopper, whopper plopper is starting at my every day, ready to get tired." Ah, oh, yep. yep, yep, yep. Oh no, we have we haven't talked about the whopper plopper. I love the whopper plopper. That's a great bait. What makes it great in your opinion? Um, you can you can um, you can run it like a buzz bait. You can pop it like a popper, and it doesn't sink. So you can you can run it in real shallow water. And it just doesn't seem to hang up as easy. A buzz bait, you know, you have to get that thing up on plane immediately. And and a popper, uh, there's there's techniques to it, you know. But a whopper plopper, it just seems like you can throw it out. And as, as long as you're moving it through the water and, you know, stopping it, starting it, stopping it, something's going to strike it. But sometimes they don't like them. Sometimes they want a popper. I think I think that's where you have to have the aggressive versus that really subtle. And then we got we got Hendon Tiny Torpedo. Yeah, uh, it doesn't use the plopper. Yep. Too. Let me Google this thing. There's a, there's another bait that I cannot remember. Um, let's see. Hey, um, a good one that uh, a good one. Lucky Lucky Craft makes one called a Kelly J Junior. It's a prop bait. It's a real good bait. Here it is. This one right here, uh, this is a brand new bait by Mega Bass. Uh, I'm going to be doing, I'm going to do a video on this at some point. I have so many things I want to do videos on. Here we go. Let me get the entire window. Boom. This one right here, it is the Mega Bass Baby Pop X BFS. It is two inches long and it's three and 16th ounce. It is a baby bait. It is a beautiful little popper, and I have had so many friends fish this thing have had fun with it. I think this will be an absolute dynamite little popping bait that you can use and just smoke them this summertime. Yeah, I like the size of it. Yeah, two inches, dude. Like you could, yeah. and this is something where you can have like your wife go out there and actually, if she's listening, and she can actually catch stuff and help you out uh, in a tournament. Uh, but like the hot gill color, I really like the chartreuse. I think chartreuse or the wild gill, like these two would be banging, but I'm going to buy a bunch of these now. And this, oh, sorry. One last thing. Buy your topwater baits before topwater season because they'll go out of stock in July. So get them a month ahead of time. So you're ready to go. Yeah. Fun fact. Uh, but anyway, I kind of hijacked the show there. What other baits do you have for us? Do you have any, anything well, else you've been catching them on? Those hey, those jerk baits have been working real well, and they're gonna they're gonna keep working with the water warming up. These um, see that little jig head there? Yes, I do. And then the uh, this this one's a used one, but uh, those those Z-Man ticklers, man, the green pumpkin, and the copper truce colored ones. Those are Whew. those are killers, man. Here's here's a copper truce. I don't know. I like the copper truce color. I why does that stupid tickler work so well? I have no idea. Uh, it just does. And then uh, just the, the just just your net rig. I have these two. I have green pumpkins, and I have some other colors too. But uh, just those are all tried and true lures, man. I love if you yell out the word tickler. My my oh, fishing partner. So embarrassing to tell. What kind of bait is this? You're like, uh, uh, it's called a tickler. That's the tickler. Yeah, that's the ticket. Yep. Yeah, my 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 uh my fishing partner. You yell that word out. He comes out of the out of the shadows. Uh, he <laughs> loves that bait. He kicks my ass with it all the time. And then hey, if 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 the people if if you if you guys are looking for also another jig head besides the one I have, these right here that I have. If you can see those, can you see those? Yes. Yeah, these finesse jig heads that I have here. And um, also, I don't know, very, a lot of people just kind of don't know, I don't think. But Charlie Brewer slider heads, man. Yep. It's a di different hook. These, these things are killers, though, man. Use them on, uh, on plastics, you know, three-inch, four-inch plastics. 
usually swim baits. So that's awesome, dude. That's awesome. Well, what are some baits that you're going to be getting? You're going to be gearing up towards in March. Is oh, it all? I'm going to be. Um, I'm going to do a do the old March Madness sale here um, soon. I'm going to put stuff Ooh. on sale. I'm going to put all my crankbaits on sale. Nice. We'll put a uh, when I uh, link in the episode description uh, to I'll that. Put the crankbaits on sale. My my. <laughs> I still have a few reels that are on sale. Um. Cause I want to, I want to get some more, some more stuff in. Um, if you guys, uh, and here's another, here's, here's something else. I use this stuff religiously, man. And, uh, they're, uh, they're in Pennsylvania gamma. A lot of people, I don't know why people don't know about it. This isn't an off brand. This isn't like something from, um, Amazon gamma is a company in Pennsylvania. This fishing line is awesome. Hmm. And that right there is the fluorocarbon. I didn't know they're from Pennsylvania. Yeah, they're in Pennsylvania, man. That's and, pretty cool. um, and another thing that people overlook, a lot of people want to go out and buy. Um, I've had expensive reels too, but Daiwa, Daiwa's come a long way. Do you remember Daiwa just had used to have junk? That was yeah, I do. Do you remember that? I was a Shimano guy. Well, Shimano, that that that's those are great reels and stuff. But I mean, Daiwa makes makes a good reel, man. You guys. Anyone see these Fuegos? The Fuegos are good. I have the Steve. I have the Steve's. I'm not that. I'm not, I don't and make if them. Uh, if you're into the River Smallmouth, I think it is. If you're into River Smallmouth, the two sizes I suggest for plastics 1000 series and then the 2500 series. Hmm. 2500 would be for lures for, for bigger baits. But the 1000, I mean, people think these are small reels. They catch big fish because you can you can uh, land carp on them. I've landed uh, musky with them bass fishing. So keep that in mind. One thousand series reels. One thousand series reels is, and, and then honestly, I would yeah, one thousand series reel is extremely freaking good. Um, yeah, I mean, so what is your favorite crankbait? As we're getting closer to crankbait crank season. Crankbaits. Oh, let me get let me get a uh, pull of crankbaits now. Jeff is giving us the absolute juice tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Crankbait's probably my favorite crankbait. Hold on, let me get let me get another one too. Hold on. I really rely on um, when I'm fishing. I rely on the bandits. This is a 200, so so this one you don't want to use this at the waters two or three feet deep. Oh, that's my favorite color. Oh my goodness. Uh the the bandits. I have I have a bunch of these. These are gonna go on sale. And I'm gonna put these on sale too. But these these right here are just straight up killers on on the both rivers. The Rapala DT series. The DT fours yeah. is just a perfect size. That DT four stands for it's gonna dive to four feet, but you can run it so that it'll go in three feet, four feet. And then this one right here, if if it's just not getting down far enough, you can go to this one. And this one will go down to, uh, it says four to eight feet, but I think it's going down to maybe six. Mm. You'd have to do some real cranking on it to get it to go eight feet. Dude, that is such a slick little bait. Go back to yeah. the, uh, go back to the bandit. The bandit? Yeah, this is the yeah. bandit right here, yeah. <sighs> that Bandits thing. are good, man. Yeah, I just, that color don't pattern. don't talk about them enough. They don't. They really, it is a cry. Or maybe it's a good thing, actually, honestly, because like more people would be throwing them. But that is a beautiful, but, beautiful but the Rappalas color. Too man, the, the Rapala, whatever color you like, but Rapalas are just the, the DT fours, smallmouth on the on the both rivers level. Really? Yeah. Yep. They're uh, they're awesome. We have so many cool. Like, uh, okay, we got another one here from Joe. Uh, Joe, it was really nice to meet you this past weekend, by the way, sir. I really appreciate it. Uh, Joe, looking to get a good multi-purpose combo. Any suggestions? Now, before we answer this, Joe, um, do you want? Do you mean spinning or bait casting? So I'm going to put this question back until you answer that part. I want to make sure we get that completely correct. Do you mean bait casting or spinning? Yeah. Um, because yeah, like there's some rabbit holes we can go down there. Uh, with your crankbait setup, though, are you you use spinning tackle completely? Correct. Yeah, because uh, that's the easiest stuff for uh, for customers to use. And then we got so okay. What, what, I, what I'm using? Oh, bait casting. Oh, but yeah. What I'm using for um for uh for uh 
lures such as that 2500 series a seven foot medium action rod that's actually yeah that works perfectly well and i think uh uh we had somebody else in the chat honestly i think it was cliff cliff i think cranks on braid but yeah so so to answer your question there joe if you're trying to get into bait casting i'll take a crack at this and again everybody has their own opinions on this too so don't feel free to go like to tactical bass and tactical bass and has great videos on this as well i think a medium heavy bait caster with an extra fast tip if you have an extra fast tip rod what that allows you to do is throw baits that are a little bit lighter so if you have a medium action rod tip it's you're gonna need to throw something a little bit heavier to get some feel with it if you have an extra fast tip you can throw something a little bit lighter a phoenix phoenix featherlight makes a really good rod for that shimano i think makes a good rod for that as well or yeah go down to like a medium setup for the bait caster especially if you're dealing with like small mouth um the other thing is a lot of companies now make bfs style rods which just means bait caster finesse which i will do a whole video on that here soon as well or a live stream about that but that just means it'll be like a medium light to an ultralight rod um and I've seen like an ultralight triple X rod. What's cool about that is you can throw like Panther Martins, baby crankbaits and trout magnets on it. So tons of stuff there. I don't know if I answered your question about the combo setup, but then when it comes to reels, what do you like? Are you a lose guy? Are you a Shimano guy? Are you a Daiwa guy? Like, uh, like whatever you like in that real combo, pick one that's about a six speed. A, a six one gear ratio is kind of like, I think generically like the best and then pick the brand that you feel confident with. Um, and then Kyle, I, I hopefully I answered your question. If you're looking for more, but just let me know and I'll try to answer a little bit more. Um, Kyle says, uh, uh, the rattle trap too. I have never fished a rattle trap for small mouth. Just going to say, yeah, it. they work, man. I've never done it before. Here's hold on. I got one. He's got, of course he's got one. Dude's got the best man cave ever. The fact that I'm not over there drinking beers right now is a crime against humanity. Honestly, Absolutely, just the coolest giving, man uh, cave. The uh, Lucky Craft brand, and these are the uh, LVs, <sighs> dude. I'm right here, man. I love that color. You don't want to. You don't want to be too big. Um, or the re regular rattle trap, that brand rattle trap. They they sell good ones. I I can't think of another brand right now. I've, I've so I had it and I lost it. Uh, the the name. But uh, Lucky Craft sells. I mean, these are these are solid lures. And you know, you need certain. You know, you really need certain conditions to uh, catch them with the crankbait. Do you do anything else with those things to get them like ready for game day? Do you change the hooks out? Do you use a different no. type of rod? Mm -mm. No, I'm just using a, uh, a seven foot medium action uh, spinning rod with a uh, 2500 spinning reel. And then you, you're going to, um, I mean, you, you know, you, you're going to throw it out and um, you're going to kind of pulse it through the water, pulsate it through the water a little bit. It's not just a direct retrieve. I don't feel, do people appreciate how strong spinning reels are and spinning rods? I feel like in the bass fishing industry, people don't appreciate how strong those suckers are. I mean, and they, like, catch, they catch shark down in the uh, Florida Keys. 4,000 series reels. Yep. They catch uh, permit. Um, they catch tarpon. Yeah, and and you get casting. I you get based on physics, you will get more casting distance out of a spinning rod than a bait caster. You just will. Um, Kyle says all the top anglers. Well, you see, that's a whole video. And Doc Talk's coming back next week, guys. I promise. Doc Talk is going to come back next week. We have a special Doc Talk episode, actually. Uh, I, I, I'm going to spill the beans right now. So, Doc Talk next week, we are going to be having an episode with SB Fishing, Phil from Mystery Tack Tackle Box, and Hunter oh. Smith from Smith Mountain Lake. So, we're going to get them on the show. Um, but yeah, all the anglers are using spinning rods now. Oh, Jeff, what do you got? The um, also another don't sleep on these chatter baits in the spring for smallmouth. People associate chatter baits with uh, largemouth. Chatter baits catch big smallmouth. What's there's, fair there's, there's been instances where uh, 
where they won't even hit a spinner bait, but you'll throw it in the same spot with a chatter bait and they'll hit it. What's your favorite chatter bait? These, um, the Z mans, just the regular Z man, the originals. They're easy to find. Trailer. Yeah. The trailer is usually uh, some type of, uh, uh, swim bait. I like like Kitex swim baits to put on. Them. What four about inch, uh, f- four inch, uh, swim baits. <sighs> Color. Um, to match the skirt, if it's a brown one, a brown, brown colored one, uh, dark green or green pumpkin, just, I like the trailers to match the, uh, so w- whatever would match this color right here, which is a brown and black, mm, okay. maybe a black sw- swim bait or a brown swim bait, something like that. Dude, that's absolutely sick. I love that color. Yeah. That's something else I got to do is I got to fish more of those. I got so many techniques I want to learn this year. I got to like figure all that out. I just wish I could just fish full time, honestly, just to get Chatter everything done. Are, um, that's a that's a, a different uh, different bait too. I mean, you got to throw it out and you got to get it going immediately. And um, yeah, yeah, it's about like as soon as that hits the water, you can engage the reel and just get it going. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a pretty cool bite. I like the spinner bait bite though. I've heard rumors of this legend. How good is that bite? The what? The spinner bait bite. Where? For smallmouth. It's good. Is it fun? Yeah, it's my favorite. Um, it's that and the j- jerk bait. I, I would say are my two favorite ways to uh, catch fish, or smallmouth on the Potom- or on the Potomac and the Susquehanna. The uh, spinner bait bite is <laughs> real violent. It's just a violent strike. Hmm. And then um, there's times where you'll see them. They'll 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 chase the bait and they'll swipe at it. You know, they'll keep swiping at it and. Um, you know, I've had them come back after it four or five times. I think <sighs> top water is up there for me. And then if I had to think of another really good bite, I like it's been to Miki rig fishing, honestly. Um, but that's like a complete niche. And I think the reason I enjoy that right now is just, it's in my mind is something I've done the most of recently. Mm-hmm. So I, I got to try a spinnerbait bite. I've never caught a small mouth on a spinnerbait before you in haven't? my life. I have never done that before. It's been, I'm a Ned you rig. I'm a tube. In this yeah. Spring. Yeah, we do. I've been a Ned rig tube, top water swim bait guy. Well, I mean, most of the time I'm fishing plastics too. And these two techniques I just told you are my favorite way. I mean, there's only certain times you can catch them with them. I a hundred percent agree. Like, and when they're on it, they're on it. 65 days a year. <laughs> you can catch them with plastics. I've also heard that you can catch them on swim baits and I I've caught oh, one yeah. or two on the big dogs, but this year I'm going to spend way more time throwing the big stuff around. Oh, you're talking about those big swim baits. Mm-hmm. I was thinking you're talking about like some Kai tech three inch or four. Oh, oh here, here I got working that. them through the water. Here we go. So Mike Buka, cause Mike Buka thinks I'm kind of famous. Got me this. This is a this is uh one of the bull shads he has, and it's not cu- it's not painted. But here's the cool thing about this bait, this custom bait. The tail is yellow. So it's a chartreuse in white. And this is not too big. That is smallmouth size, boys and girls. Must and be able to hit that. I am gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna make the first cast with it, and it's gonna be gone from a toothy dude. But yeah, that a muskie's gonna eat it. I think that's gonna be my tournament bait this year on big slack. That's gonna win some money. It's throwing that big boy around. Um, I don't know. That's what I'm looking forward to the most. Go to Williamsport and fish around there a lot this spring and see if a muskie will take it. I think a muskie would. I, that's why I, I feel like I really want to throw like a uh, a leader material with this thing just to protect it because I'm terrified of losing these baits to the toothy and guys. What's um. What what's that creek that comes out, or is it a creek river? Jig. The Conica jig, yeah, the Conica yeah. jig. Yeah, go up in that area and throw that thing, mess around up there long enough, and uh, see how that's, long you have it. Hey, that's if you do that, don't do. like wire. Just put real heavy uh, monofilament on there as a leader. Really? Yeah, real heavy. Hmm. Something ridiculous, like thirty pound. <laughs> that's actually a good idea, honestly. And um, like- they're not going to cut it as cut it as easy. Yeah, because I'm like just terrified. Like I don't want to lose the baits because, like you know, like these things are hard to get. They're expensive. I just don't want to lose them. I had a muskie on recently on the um on the Potomac. He had a two and three quarter inch tube, and uh, I was like, oh man, this is a good fish. And I start reeling it in, and it's a um, and I see it, and it's a muskie. Like oh shit, it's a muskie, right? And uh, 
I get him close to the boat and I have him up and, and I'm railing him. I'm like, I got this guy, you know, railing. And he does a head shake, gone. He cut mm-hmm. the line with his teeth. I, I had hooked him up in the, instead of in the corner. I mean, you, you don't know where you're going to hook him, but if I would have hooked him in the corner, in the back corner of his mouth, he wouldn't have been able to get away from me. But I had him hooked like, like you do a small mouth. And I set the hook straight up in his, uh, the roof of his mouth. And all it took was a head shake. And he was, he was about five feet from the boat. I was going to get him in. He was probably about three feet long. Dang, dude. That's freaking awesome. Ah, that's awesome. All right. Last question of the evening, guys. Last question of the evening. I got some homework to do uh, for my, my other jobby thingy. Yes, I do. Uh, let's see. Yep. So basically, question we got here as I get it up I here. Here. Oh, yep. I got some. And this, this is from Brian. This is what I use. I use these on my spare baits. Right here, the trailer hooks, one odds. But now I don't use them all the time. If um, if I'm spinnerbait fishing and I, um, you know, you're out with me and we're spinnerbait fishing, and they're swiping and, and they're just missing, or you're barely, you know, you're not hooking them, or or let's say that they're, um, they'll grab the blade sometimes and they'll hold on all the way to the boat and then they'll let go. Um, then you have to you have to put a trailer hook on there. Because if, if you've ever caught one with a spinnerbait, you'll notice sometimes you'll catch them on the outside of their, their mouth, up, up under like their chin area. Mm-hmm. And that's because they're going after the blades. Mm. You, hook them. you hook them on the outside of their mouth. Interesting. But, you know, that, that trailer hook solves that problem real quick, especially if you're swiping at it. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll snag them. Hmm. So. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah. Jeff, I mean, I this has been this is always fun to have you on the show. Um, do you have any openings if people want to go out with you guiding? Yeah, like, next, how do they get next week? The, the weather's good next week, and like I said, I got the uh, the March everyone what what a corny thing, but the March Madness sale. I'm gonna I'm gonna start advertising for it. it it'll happen. It'll start off sometime next week. It'll probably go through all of March. <laughs> And then as always, guys, what I'll do is once the sale goes up, I'll link it and I'll start pushing it as well just to kind of get you guys aware of the sale uh, when it starts happening. Uh, And then as always, like right now, guys, if you go in the episode description, there's a link to all of Jeff's stuff. This will be re-uploaded the next 24 hours as a podcast. And then you can also click on all the links as well just to help support him. If anyone on here has any questions about a jet boating, I think people, we, we talked about that earlier, right? Yes. Uh, getting out on your jet boat. You have a question about a jet boat. S- s- send me a uh, some type of email or something. Yep, Text yep. me an email, whatever. Message me and uh, m- maybe I can help you. Yes. And then I, a couple of people have already reached out to me personally. When we hit 100 Patreon subscribers, uh, I will be doing a live stream, which means probably tomorrow night we'll be doing a Patreon members live stream to celebrate or just a, 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 a celebration of uh, hitting a hundred. We should so, do a live stream while jet boating. We should do a live stream while jet boating. It'll be, that no, would be very while, epic. While we're jet boating. Oh, while we're jet boating going up the river. Yeah. That would be freaking awesome. That would be awesome, dude. Uh, anyway, guys, yeah, please, please subscribe to Jeff. Uh, you know, he's one of the best guys in the Upper Potomac River. Uh, please reach out to him if you have any questions about safety, fishing, anything. If I can subscribe to Fishing the DMV, it really helps us out and check us out in the algorithm. Uh, check it, algorithm. Check us out on Patreon too. Help support the show. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.